We rely on plants every minute of every day, from the air we breathe to the soil we step on. Cultures have grown with different local plants, gathering knowledge, relationships, and uses for these plants. Think of all the times you interact with plants or plant-derived material in a day. The foods we eat, homes we build, some of the clothes we wear, fuel we burn, the medicines we take, the ecosystems we rely on, and the air we breathe. We know we need plants, but what do plants need? First, there are the basic needs that we know well, so water, light, nutrients. And then it becomes a little bit more complicated because different plants like different things, because they themselves are different from each other genetically. For some plants, some conditions are deal breakers, while others have more range of what they can accept as living conditions. Climate, hot, cold, humidity, and the length of seasons, all these factors can influence what plants grow in an area. Soil pH. There's a whole range of soils from acidic to alkaline. Soil type. What types of dirt is in your soil? What is the soil composition? Is it clay, silt, or sand-like? What types of mixes can you find? Soil health. How nutritious is the soil? Is there lots of soil life? Light. So how much sun is there? What about throughout the day? How many hours of sun is there? Wind. Is it windy? Is there any protection from strong winds? Slope. Is the ground flat or on a slope? Water. Is the area wet? Does the water drain or is it always wet? Plant needs are more complicated than a few checkboxes, like our needs. Do you think by having some form of food, water and light you could have all your needs met? No. And the same applies to plants. We are all part of a complex ecosystem where there is much at play. Another important thing to notice is how long a plant lives, which brings us to... Annuals are plants that go through their entire life cycle in one year or less. From germinating from a seed, to spreading their own seeds for the next generation, and then of course dying. All in one quick cycle. Biennials, like for example carrots, are similar to annuals, but take two years to get through their life cycle from being a seed to producing seeds before dying. Perennials will live for more than two years, and depending on the species, that number will vary a lot. The oldest tree is currently 4,855 years old. Plants can die back to the soil level, but sprout new growth from their roots the following year, or they can continue to grow above ground, like in the case of trees. There are many advantages to perennials. They usually need less water, have deeper roots, require less maintenance, and many can survive longer seasons, which means food early in the spring and later in the fall. Okay, so you're ready to plant your garden. How do you want to start? You can buy plants from local greenhouses or specialized sellers. But with a little research and experimentation, you can also learn how to grow your own. Cutting is, as the name suggests, cutting a part of the plant to regrow another plant. There are multiple types of cuttings, using the stem, leaves, and roots of the plants. The idea is to take a part of the plant and cause it to root to make another identical plant. Division is when you dig up a part of the root. The part you divide will be used to start a new plant. Layering is when you take a branch and bend it under the soil until it roots itself. Once this happens, the branch can be cut off from the main plant. You now have two plants. Grafting is the strange Franken-style process of taking two plants and making them one. Sounds weird and scary, but you see this all the time on fruit trees. How does it work? Well, there are many different methods to grafting. Some involve grafting a part like a branch to another tree, for example, you'd have an apple tree with different branches growing different varieties of apples. Or sometimes it's almost the entire tree that is changed. We start with rootstock, the variety that will be in the ground, and graft onto the main stem the varieties we want for fruit. We then have the qualities from the rootstock, like tree size, with the fruit we want to grow. A newer technology that is gaining some popularity, as well as some concerns and debate over its safety, where a plant is created from the cells of a previous plant. 
This is more of a lab method, but there are kits for sale to use this method on a personal scale. Finally, let's explore possibly one of the most well-known ways of growing plants, seeds. Some plants, with the right conditions, can self-seed and create the next generation with no humans being involved. That means you may find those plants growing in your garden without having to plant them every year. We call this self-seeding. What if a plant doesn't self-seed? That's where we come in. Seeds can also be planted in the soil with our help to start all kinds of plants. Seeds are amazing and they can be easily shared and some can be stored for quite a long time to be used later on, which is great for food security. Anyone else get overwhelmed when looking at seed options? Open pollinated, hybrid, F1, F2, heirlooms, heritage seeds, it can all get very confusing. So what is a GMO seed? GMO means genetically modified organism. As the name suggests, GMOs are organisms that have been changed genetically in a lab. Genes from animals, bacteria, plants, and more can be combined in this way to make new creations. GMOs are a process that could not happen in nature on its own. There is still a lot of debate about GMO foods in terms of health and environmental concerns. But in terms of seed saving, patented seeds, like GMOs, need to be bought year after year. It means less control in the hands of the farmer and a dependence on a small group of sellers. So what is a hybrid seed? A hybrid, on the other hand, comes from an intentional cross of two varieties of plants, meaning a human that chooses two varieties of the same plant and breeds them. But the important thing to note is that unlike GMOs, this mixing could potentially happen in nature on its own. We are not mixing different species together or plants with animals. With hybrids, we take similar plants and create a new variety. For example, types of tomatoes. So why go through all the trouble of mixing varieties? One big positive to using hybrid seeds is that some varieties can be bred for specific traits, like for example, disease resistance, quicker crops, or even great taste. But if you fall in love, you may be committing yourself to a lifetime of buying seeds. But if you're ready to experiment and take chances on what you get, these seeds can still be an interesting experience. After all, diversity in plants is not a bad thing. A few quick differences to note. First, we have the F1 hybrids. Those hybrids are the first generation of a mix. So for example, two different types of cucumbers are combined by hand pollination under control conditions to create seeds that will carry specific traits, like for example, an early crop for a northern climate. These types of hybrids tend to be very productive, but these seeds need to be bought every year if you want the same results. And the seeds usually cost more. Then we have F2 hybrids, which are when seeds from F1 hybrids are kept and then grown. They typically do not produce as much as F1s and usually vary a lot from one to the next, but it can be neat to experiment with these seeds. Some people keep the seeds from their best plants year after year until they get something they like that keeps producing similar plants. Open pollinated seeds are great for seed saving. They can be pollinated by wind, pollinators, or even with the help of birds. But here's where it gets a little weird. Some open pollinated plants tend to self-pollinate, while others have a higher chance to cross-pollinate. What does this mean? The ones that tend to self-pollinate will stay similar, while the ones who tend to cross-pollinate may not because they share genetics with the other plant they are breeding with. For example, it may be harder to grow squash from kept seeds from year to year and have similar plants unless things are done to prevent different varieties from pollinating each other. So what are heirloom and heritage plants? Although they can mean different things to different people, heirloom and heritage seeds are from open pollinated plants that have been around for a long time. The debate comes from how many years it takes for a plant to receive a title like that. One common standard is that the plant should be around for 50 years or more. Once upon a time, the heirloom wasn't an heirloom and just a great variety of crop that someone really enjoyed. This cross was kept and over time, through years and generations of keeping seeds, the genetics stabilized to create the heirlooms we see today. These seeds are great keepers and tend to produce similar plants from their seeds. Many save their seeds from year to year for their gardens. Genetics affect which species can live in an ecosystem. A cactus will not grow outside here in Sudbury because it is not equipped with the right things to survive it. But a white pine is set up for success when it comes to surviving harsh winters. 
So what makes species of plants so different? Let's explore a few. Natural selection can change species over time. When species don't survive, their genetics are taken out of the gene pool. We are then left with species that can survive the challenges of an area. Species can be vulnerable to different things, but no species is completely safe from every possible event or change. Many crops we grow today, like broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, kale, and cabbage, all come from the same relative, wild mustard. Over time, humans picking certain seeds from certain plants influence the species. We now have plants that look very different from the original plants and from each other. This is how we got a lot of our agricultural plants. What about barriers? What happens when certain things stop some individuals from breeding with each other? Over time, these two groups may become very different from each other and become different species. And if we talk about the creation of new species, we should probably talk about losing species as well. Extinction is when a species dies out, meaning there are no more individuals from that species alive. When we lose species, it also affects the ecosystems where the species live. There is much at play in an ecosystem, all kinds of dynamics that keep things balanced, and sometimes losing one species can really upset the whole system. A species that holds that type of power on an ecosystem is called a keystone species. In this region, red pines, Canadian goldenrod, and low bush blueberries are great examples of keystone species that are really important to our ecosystems. Since the 1800s and the Industrial Revolution, extinction rates have been rocketing. Since then, the extinction rate is 500 times bigger than it used to be. And one of the biggest causes of loss of biodiversity is agriculture. So how does this all tie in with the agriculture we see today? Humans have created unnatural ecosystems around the world. Ecosystems that in nature would not continue as they are, but are pushed to remain a certain way. Planting only one crop, using pesticides and fertilizers, tilling, using heavy machinery, and breaking habitats to grow more fields all cause harm. In terms of losing biodiversity and food, in only 100 years, we have lost 75% of food varieties worldwide. And more largely than just food, the way we do industrial agriculture is also harming the ecosystems and is contributing to climate change. There isn't just one way to do things. There are so many ways to create great food while protecting and restoring ecosystems. Polyculture, permaculture, food forests, regenerative agriculture, silvopasture pasture, there are a lot of options out there. It's also important to recognize the traditional knowledge involved in many of these methods. There is a lot of knowledge that comes from indigenous communities around the world that already practiced a lot of these brilliant methods of growing food long before terms like permaculture were invented. Changes can be made at a large scale and also at a personal level. How? Here are some ideas. Avoid or limit the use of large-scale machinery, tillers, pesticides, chemical fertilizers, and other chemicals that hurt ecosystems. Create walking pathways in the garden to avoid compacting soil where plants are growing. Cover soils with mulch and ground cover plants. Plant more native and perennial species. Plant species that are good at sinking carbon into the soil, like hawthorn, sumac, willow, apple, and birch. Prioritize biodiversity by planting many different species of plants. Leave some wild spaces untouched. Consider soil tests to understand your soils and its needs. Feed the soil with available nutrition like compost, manure, and biochar. Upcycle materials when possible and create closed loop systems. That means using what we already have and building systems that don't create waste in the first place. And as individuals, what can we do? When possible, we can buy local foods and products, grow some of our own food and medicine, get to know our local farmers and how they grow food, explore different ways of growing food, learn how to make, preserve, and store food and medicine, limit food and material waste, compost foods that we cannot use, take part in community projects and gardening, create and build community to share resources, skills, projects, spaces, and build a support system. When we create spaces where it's easier for species to survive, 
We offer a haven for biodiversity and species to flourish. Together, we can create beautiful, healthy spaces that bring food, safety, and community. Want to learn more and try permaculture hands-on? We have a target to build one edible food forest in every ward of Sudbury. That means there is likely one near you already. We have many projects to get involved in, from planting to maintenance to harvesting. We also have free workshops and learning sessions. Get in touch and find more info on our website at subresharedharvest.ca.